So what happens then is after the disaster at Charleston, the American Congress chooses Horatio Gates, the victor of Saratoga, rushes him south and asks him to build a, an army. And this time it's North Carolina that takes on the task of really outfitting and putting together and they, they exhaust themselves resource-wise to uh, put together Gates's army. Gates probably shouldn't have did what he did, but he decided to invade immediately. He was being pushed by, you know, politicians that we need something done. And he moved into northern South Carolina and got that army destroyed at the Battle of Camden. So you've had two complete American armies destroyed. Georgia, South Carolina are overrun. North Carolina is prostate. So really what Congress does then is said, to George Washington, okay, you pick the next general, and they increase the Southern Department. Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania are all part of the Southern Department. But all supplies are going to have to come from the Upper South uh, because this Lower South is exhausted and they don't manufacture anything down there. It's, it's a plantation economy or a farm economy. And the British are wise to that. So that when Nathaniel Green is named commander and moves down to take what, over what's left of Gates's army, which was a, 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 was a, a pittance or a small number and also was in bad shape uh, materially, they send a force into the lower uh, Virginia. Uh, actually, they send one force. Cornwallis recalls it to South Carolina, so they send another course, uh, force. Benedict Arnold, the American trader, is, is, leads that second force, uh, and then he's overtaken. They bring a, a British officer because they didn't trust Arnold either. So uh, a man named Phillips comes in there, and then eventually Cornwallis moves up into, but that's later. But anyway, they cut the supply lines. They make sure that things cannot flow from uh, the middle Atlantic states to Green. So Green takes command of the South. He has an army that is really a handful. He has uh, all that's left of organized resistance. Other than that is a group of guerrillas, partisans, they call them. Uh, so that's not a significant force. And the British are poised on the, the border of uh, North Carolina. Cornwallis is poised on the border of North Carolina to invade into, I'm sorry, the border of South Carolina, North Carolina, to invade into North Carolina. He starts to move one time, and a group of over-the-mountain men is the over the mountain militia come and they destroy a loyalist force that is protecting Cornwallis's flank. So he pulls back, calls for that force that's in the Virginia to join him. So he's now strong enough and he's just ready to invade again when Green comes to the south. Green gets there and finds the army is just so destitute that it can't stay where it is anymore. So he splits his army and he does it because he's looking at what is uh, he understands popular psychology, and he it knows that he's going to move the main army to the east, into northern South Carolina, into an area called the Shiraz on the PD River. He's going to move there because there's supplies there. He can feed his army, and he hopes to reorganize it. But at the same time, he doesn't want to appear to be running away from the British. So he sends Daniel Morgan with a smaller force into northern South Carolina, over to the west, moving in the direction of, if you will, to almost parallel with Cornwallis's position. And he never expected Morgan to fight a battle. Morgan was supposed to be mobile enough that he would run away if he ever had a, a problem. Well, Morgan didn't run away. He, he stood there, but Cornwallis sent one of his underlings, one of his subordinates, a man named Bannister Tarleton, who American mothers used to scare their children with. Bloody Ban, they called him, and he was known for butchering. Uh, he, at one particular uh, en engagement, he rode down the Americans after they supposedly surrendered. That's where he got his reputation. Anyway, at the Battle of Cowpens, he, his force is completely destroyed. And Morgan starts to, re to retreat with all these prisoners, and Cornwallis says, I want those prisoners, and I'm going to destroy Morgan. So he begins to, to chase after Morgan. But Morgan has enough of a head start. And the rivers, it's winter time, it's January and February, when it rains, when it snows, but particularly rain, the rivers swell. So Morgan is able to get one river ahead of Cornwallis, and that buys him time. 
Green in the interim has learned about the Battle of, of Cowpens, and he rides west with just a, a handful of troops supporting him, a sergeant's guard, they called it, joins Morgan's troops and hopes to inflict a battle on Cornwallis because he says, I've got them. They're in the interior. They're away from the coast. The British Navy can't help these guys this time. So if I can defeat them, I can do it. But now, he doesn't have the army to do it. So he hopes that the militia will join him. He sends out desperate calls to the North Carolina, South or Virginia militia. They don't come. Uh, it takes too long for them to organize. And North Carolina sees the British moving up into it, and the people aren't going to come out and commit themselves. So Green has to retreat. And he starts with Morgan and then with the main army, which has moved up and joined uh, Green's other force at Greensboro, North Carolina, Guilford Courthouse, as it was then called. And then they begin there, and they move up to the Dan River. And Green is able to retreat in a masterful effort back across the Dan River. Once he gets into Virginia, Virginia is strong enough and populous enough that he starts to get reinforcements. And then North Carolina starts down the eastern part of North Carolina in particular starts to mobilize. So Green comes across, back across the, the border almost immediately and begins to harass Cornwallis. And it's Cornwallis now that doesn't have the supplies. His men have marched through their shoes. His men are, are outnumbered. And he's the one that's desperately looking for something, and he, he decides he's going to have to fight a battle. So Green sets up at this Guilford courthouse, which he had scouted on the way up and said, this would be a good place for a battle, but he didn't, didn't get the militia in time. So he sets up his forces. Cornwallis marches in. They have this battle, which is the pivotal battle of the Southern campaigns at Guilford Courthouse. Cornwallis wins the field. In other words, his army is still in the field. Green retreats, but Cornwallis loses a third of his army. And his second in command writes back to England and says, we've lost the best. We're, we're a shadow of our former selves. So Cornwallis decides he has to, and he retreats after the battle. I mean, he holds the battlefield. But the next day, literally, he retreats, and it's Green that's pursuing. So Cornwallis heads to the coast. And the British have come up and captured Wilmington on the North Carolina coast. And that's where Cornwallis goes. And once he's there, he can resupply, et cetera. But he decides he's had enough of the Lower South. So he heads up to Virginia. He's going to take Virginia out of the war, 